What's up you guys? Welcome back. Today's video is going to be Reese sharing his story. Please ignore the fact that I like hella pale. I will self tan tonight. Leave me alone in the comment section. I know I'm pale. But uh, before we get into this, I just want to thank you for redoing this and thank you guys for suffering through that live stream last night. Every time I looked down at our phone, it looked fine. Yeah. It looked great on our end, but then when I went back and watched the playback, I was like, oh my God, this is terrible. So you guys are truly ride or die. Thank you so much for suffering through that horrible live stream. So Reese has a really good story and a lot of you guys are asking me for that. So I'm just really gonna let Reese take over my channel today. And I want you to start at the beginning and just kind of tell us where addiction started for you and when you knew you were an addict, all of that. Just kind of start with whatever you want to start with. I guess the beginning for me and when you know you're an addict, all that's hindsight and it's 2020, you know, you, yeah. you don't recognize it at the time. But um, for me, most of my usage um, started probably the same time as a lot of people, you know, junior high, 13 to 15, 16, you know, the... The recreational, the stuff at the parties, you know, the, the liquor, the beer, smoking weed, you know. I think that, you know, that was kind of where it began for me. It was part of the just fitting in with the crowd kind of yeah. thing. And um, it, it started there, you know. And I don't think that, you know, from the background I came from and the home that I came from, that wasn't, you know, that wasn't really the normal. I think that, you know, my, my mom and you know, my parents probably recognized that, that wasn't what they wanted and they thought that was probably a bad thing but I think over time I was pretty good at selling that as it was just part of what everybody else was doing um, so that kind of went on into into high school and you know and I think that at this point in time I started to get into a little bit of trouble with my drinking um, I got a couple DWIs a couple arrests for some public in toxes um, I was 16 when I got my first DWI and um, you know, I, it wasn't too long after that. I think I got a, a public in talks for that. And, you know, I ended up on probation and some of these kind of started accumulating. And at this point, I was kind of chalking it up to, I was just really unlucky. <laughs> I, I wasn't doing anything. I, I wasn't doing anything that anybody else wasn't doing. I was going to the same parties. I might've just been a frequent flyer at most of them. I was probably a regular occurrence more often than some people were. Um, but, you know, I felt in my mind, I was just really unlucky getting pulled over you know, making poor choices, and that's probably a lot of what it was, you know. So, after I'd kind of accumulated enough charges, somewhere around, I think, my junior year, about 17, I had gotten arrested several times while on probation, and to avoid some some juvenile detention time and probably some more serious repercussions, my parents were able to, I was fortunate enough that they were able to send me to a voluntary treatment center um, somewhere I think the fall of my junior year so I left school for about 90 days and went and stayed and finished up that program and kind of came back you know finished up the you know the rest of the year you know got a job kind of cleaned up my act a little bit started trying to pay off some of these fines and getting off probation and most of my senior year of high school I, th I think I was I backed off that pedal a little bit and was doing pretty good. You know, I might have been smoking a little weed here or there. You know, I had a little job, you know, working as landscaping, but I wasn't drinking, you know, I wasn't staying out all night. I wasn't, you know, and I dabbled through this time with some some pills, you know, some of the Adderall, Ritalin, you know, some of the stuff here and there, you know, prescription pills, but nothing really heavy. But, you know, most of it was, I think if you looked at it, I, I kind of fit the, the, the genre of, you know, just teenage angst a little bit. Yeah. And that's what I, I kind of wrote a lot of my troubles off to is just doing what everybody else was doing and just having some bad luck. Um, but that senior year, I kind of cleaned it up a little bit and started to get it together. And I think I was doing a pretty good job. Um, so that would probably be the first stage, you know, of, of what we're talking about and, and kind of my experience and kind of, you know, where it started for me. Um, at this point in time, I graduated and went to the military. And <clears throat> very much so in, you know, what is associated with the military type subculture, is a lot of drinking and I think my drinking really escalated at this point it it, it took off yeah. so um, kind of a work hard play hard mentality there um, you know and that's just kind of what everybody was doing so I was able to chalk up you know the lifestyle I was living because everybody else was doing it I wasn't doing anything different but at this point in time it, it really escalated for me every time I was drinking I was blacking out and um, you know if, if I woke up and I'd wet the bed because I'd, I'd been on an all-night bender I wasn't too shocked. It wasn't the first time it had happened. Uh, it might have been a little embarrassing, but it definitely wasn't unexpected with, with the kind of drinking I was doing. I was really putting the hammer down on it. And uh, obviously I wasn't doing any, any drugs at this point in time because the military does, you know, 
they do random drug screens. Everybody knows about it, and you know, maybe a little bit of here and there, you know, some some stuff. Maybe a little, you know, a little bit of white girl, you know, you know, nothing major, you know, kind of the one-off occurrence. Nothing that was going to put me in danger of being drug tested and kicked out of the military. Um, but the drinking was definitely it, it. It was what everybody was doing. It was a very hard charging mentality. You know, it was widely accepted. I was stationed in Italy, so because the drinking age in Italy is 18 and it's not 21 in the United States, if you were you were stationed there on post and you were 18, 19 year old kid, you could buy booze at, at, on the post D, on PX. You know, you could go, you could just buy it like you could here in the States if you were 21, all you needed was your military ID. So that made it really accessible. It was, you know, socially acceptable. Everybody was doing it. So it just, I didn't think there was anything wrong with, you know, the amount of drinking I was doing. Um, at this point, did it affect your job in the military? No, no, it didn't. Um, you know, and it's, 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 like I said, it's just part of what people do. People would stay up all night, drink until 2 a.m., go home, pass out, wake up at, you know, for readily at 4.30 to do PT, still stinking of booze, you know, and go run and sweat it all off. And, 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 and nobody cared as long as you showed up. It, yeah, it's just what people did. You know, and after we deployed, obviously, to, to Iraq, you know, um, you know, there wasn't a whole lot of drinking there, even though we, some of us did find some ways to, <laughs> find some ways to accomplish that here and there. Um, you know, when we came back, I think the drinking really took a big overdrive for most people because we got to come home and, um, you know, it got to the point where people, you know, were showing up for morning formation and the whole formation would kind of sway. You know, everybody <laughs> was just trying to hold attention and, and it's, everybody just kind of understood they were blowing off steam, just happy to be home. It was a long deployment. You know, we were part of the, the invasion force that jumped into Iraq. So we got to see the worst of the worst. And I think everybody was just happy to be home. So they kind of wrote that behavior off. And, um, and I, I was part of that. So, so I kind of want you to talk about a little bit about PTSD. Yep. So when you came home from after invading Iraq and he was the 329th person to jump into Iraq, yep. uh, you have medals. Yeah. He, he was pretty decorated. Uh, when he came home, you had PTSD. Yeah. How, how did that affect your life? You came home to a society that you didn't necessarily like at that moment. So kind of talk, walk me through how you viewed America after um, home. I think the biggest thing to highlight for that, it was undiagnosed PTSD. Right. It wasn't something that people were talking about. You know, since we were first wave and some of the first crowds to come home and, and, and you know, meet our date and, and return back into, you know, the civilian lifestyle, nobody was talking about it like they were, you know, at the later duration of, you know, the 10 year term that we were at war, you know, people really, it started to come to the forefront of, it was recognized, people were having, you know, soldiers were having a hard time acclimating, coming back into society. We didn't know about that. They didn't give us a debrief. They didn't talk to you about what kind of counseling you may want to look at in your, your local VAs. They just said you were free. Yeah. They just said, you can go home now. And, um, much like prison. Yeah. So, you know, and I came home with, you know, PTSD and probably a much more severe case of it than I ever wanted to admit. And I probably even recognize now. And I was heavily medicating that with drinking, you know, at the time. I think I came home and that was the first time I realized that even the people around me socially, you know, some of the friends I grew up with in my family took a real big notice to, to the drinking that I was doing. I mean, it, I would drive around. I mean, I always was, I was drinking all the time I was drinking. And, um, you know, with PTSD and coming home and, you know, being exposed to the, the kind of cultures and, you know, what life is like in some third world countries, you know, I was very resentful of the fact that people in America didn't appreciate what they had. And, you know, and I was looking around thinking that people were very weak. I had a lot, a lot of, um, you know, I don't know what, what I'm looking for, how to describe it. I, I had a lot of disdain for people that had it so easy, that didn't, didn't, didn't recognize how good it was here. I didn't know how to react to that. I didn't know how to react to people. I didn't know how to re-enter society and build relationships and maintain those healthily. You know, I, I struggled a lot. And I think I, I, I definitely self-medicated a lot with drinking. And at this point in time, you know, with coming home and starting to work for my family that had a small trucking company is when I was exposed to, to dope, to, to meth, to go fast. And um, that was pretty quickly. I think I come home in 2005. It was within that first six to eight months. So. And once I got a hold of that, I was sold. Um, that was, you know, when I think a lot of my addiction took, you know, I, I really started to take off. I kind of started to migrate away from 
the booze as much and it was pretty much just all speed and you know and a little bit of downers i had access to some pills so it was just kind of an up and down medley there for a while and uh being busy and taking on the responsibility of this company i felt that i used that as justification to 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 put myself into overdrive to use to use this speed and to use these sleepless nights as time to to grow a business to stay busy to be active and it probably looked like on the on the front on the surface that I, I was I was getting it done you know but at the same time I was very isolated like I said the PTSD didn't allow me to maintain relationships to socialize you know I worked alone primarily I, I lived alone I was very flaky and flighty with people you know I would show up to places and leave you know without notice and without saying anything it just became part of who I was so so I kind of want to talk about PTSD just for a little bit what that looks like for me I didn't know. I mean, I knew you had PTSD when we met. I didn't truly know what that meant and how that would affect me. So I remember our first year of dating, you would go to a grocery store and you hated being in that grocery store. There, you would be tense. You would just try to go like methodically from aisle to aisle. Like it was a mission almost, you know? And I, I'm a shopper that goes like this in a store. Reese is mission oriented. And it was very difficult for us to even grocery shop. So I did all of that. And I think as time has gone on and I've understood you more, understood PTSD more, and you've understood it more too, we've been able to kind of tailor our lives around it and recognize when he is feeling stressed and we work, we work as a team now. Yeah. 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 Is there nothing else you want to talk about with that? No. I mean, that's, that's okay. it. It's, it's a topic all on its own, but it, it definitely played a, a, a big part in my drug usage and my, my drinking coming home. I think that, you know, as it being a, the contributing factor that I'm aware that it is now, um, I wasn't aware of it then. I can say that, you know, being a hundred percent honest, I had no idea because we just didn't know. They didn't tell you there was no exposure to it. I had no idea. I think PTSD was a term that I'd probably heard and it was thrown around very loosely, but I didn't see the things in my life and how it was applicable to that. I do now. Um, but back then I didn't, you know, so. Okay. So let's kind of go back a little bit to using meth. And I kind of want to talk about how you, how you were in relationships a little bit. And when you realize it was a problem, because when you're isolated and using it alone, you can kind of tell yourself it's not a problem. You need it to work. And he was a one man show when it came to this trucking company. He was doing so much. I mean, you really needed a team of people. Yeah. You were doing like five different jobs between payroll and booking loads and all of that, just trying to keep it going. I think that you needed definitely more people and you justified to your own self that it was a problem. So at what, or that it wasn't a problem, you needed it. So at what point did you realize it was a problem and you know, <sighs> I don't know if that question was all over the place. It was a little bit. I'm sorry. Um, probably need to corral that into siloed into a couple topics. Um, okay. Because of the industry I was in, it was available. Um, it was a presence. It you know it's it, it's a subculture of its own inside of you know the trucking industry. So you know my exposure to it wasn't probably you know it it, it wasn't by chance. You know, and I think you know when I got a hold of it, it became my primary drug of choice for sure. Mm -hmm. um, so, but at the same time, like you talked about growing, you know, this small business that I'd, I'd kind of inherited that I was fortunate enough to have the opportunity to, to have a job when I came home out of the military. Um, I used it to fuel, you know, the, the, the dope to fuel my, my work efforts, you know, and, and I basically kind of became an isolated workaholic. And I, I, I use that as an excuse to isolate myself from people, from anything that wasn't, you know, I, I knew that doing drugs and working like I did was not acceptable you know i knew that it wasn't socially acceptable i knew that people if they were aware of what i was doing in the lifestyle i was living they wouldn't approve um, you're also justifying it because you had tremendous success yes yeah and so as this company continued to grow and my, my usage compounded you know i was using it as, as a crutch and a tool to continue to go and grow at the same rate you know taking on multiple hats doing multiple things um and really i you know, I use that as the just justification to expand my usage and it became a daily thing. You know, I couldn't operate without it. And, um, and if I didn't have it, you know, it was done. There, there wasn't any work getting done. I wasn't going anywhere. It was over until, until I got, until I got back up. How long did you use math? <sighs> um, you know, probably six or seven years from the, from the time that I, I was exposed to it to the time that I, I got clean. 
a long time. Yeah, so it was. And very much so at the beginning, I wasn't exposed to the the world and, and the addicts that live in it because I was so isolated with my usage and, and working for myself, living by myself. I wasn't hanging out or associating with these people. I wasn't peeking out windows. I was, I was getting high, you know, probably cleaning my apartment twice a day, going back to work, you know, doing the job of three or four people and then just repeating this over and over and over. And it yielded results. You know, I mean, the, the company started to grow. I made a little bit of money. I started to accumulate some things. You know, I bought a nice car. I had a BMW. I had a, I had, I had a truck that was paid for a nice, you know, Z71, uh, GM, or it was a, yeah, it was a, it was a GMC. Yeah, it was a GMC. Um, nice pickup, lifted up, nice tires, custom rims, you know, um, so I used this as my reasoning to continue doing what I was doing and, and I knew that it wasn't accepted by, you know, you know, society, but at the same time, nobody knew what was going on. I'm sure some of the drivers and some of the people that saw me pretty closely knew, but yeah. you know, not the rest of them, you know, my family, um, they probably had an idea that something was going on, but they couldn't put their finger on it. You know, they, they didn't see me enough to, to make a judgment call. And, um, and I, at this point I would kind of whittle down, you know, the, fr the circle of friends I had, I wasn't going out much and this is all I did. This was my life for, you know, several years. So, so I want to fast forward to the company going under the recession took place, the company closed. How did you take that when you had to close the doors in the mm. trucking company? As a, as a, as a failure that I think that was the first big, you know, failure I experienced as an adult and. I didn't know how to take that. That hit me pretty hard. Um, that was your identity. That was who you yeah, were. Yeah, I, I had kind of put everything I had into this little venture and thought this was going to be, you know, was going to be mine. You know, this is what I was going to retire on. This is what I was going to build. One day I was going to have a successful company and lots of people working for me. And I was going to get to say I did it all on my own. You know, I was kind of the American dream sort of thing. And, um, and I, when I put everything into it, you know, I... I since I'd isolated myself, I said, oh, I'd given up relationships, friends, social life, all for the growth of this company. And to some degree, that was a fair assessment. To some degree, I was, I was doing drugs and I didn't want anybody to see me. So, um, you know, there, there was, it was definitely a double-edged sword. Um, but when that happened, I, I didn't really know how to take it. I took it pretty hard. You know, at this point in time, you know, before it closed up, I'd gotten married. I'd had a failed marriage to, you know, somebody I, did, I should have never gotten involved with. Um, you know, I had bought a house, you know, I, I bought her a BMW, I, I'd upgraded mine, you know, so I was really seeing, you know, what looked like a really successful life to the outside world. And when that had to shutter and it closed, I didn't really know what to do with that. There was no way I could sustain that lifestyle and sustain my drug habit, you know, with, without this revenue stream. So it, it became a problem pretty quickly for me. So how long after the trucking company closed did you lose the house, the BMWs, the trophy mm -hmm. wife? How long after that? Because you did go to, and work for another company. You got fired from that because he was using drugs and erratic. So what mm -hmm. was the timeline there? Less than two years. Less than two years. Less than two years. Yeah, I think, you know, up to this point, it was probably 2010. And I got home in 2005. You know, from 2010, you know, mid-2010 on, the spiral was pretty pretty quick and it was it was full tilt nose down for me it, you know it just exponentially multiplied life got life got worse by the month it seemed like there for a while and uh you know and i had several opportunities on the way down to recognize this assess the situation put the brakes on what i was doing and pull up and recover but like most addicts i didn't i, I just continued you know i continued my free fall and i was content with what i was doing i think to some degree i hung on to the realization that, you know, if I just were to get it together here real soon, you know, when I, when I had lost the house and I'd gotten another job, I thought, you know, if I could stop this free fall and just kind of clean up my act a little bit, I could put it back together at any moment. You know, I really clung to that delusion, I think for, for that first year or so, you know, after losing that company that, you know, and getting released from working from another company because you can't hide a full fledged drug problem working in the corporate world. People notice it. Um, it's, it's very obvious. Yeah. You know, I wasn't, I was no longer working in an office by myself, sitting and dispatching trucks all phone and email. And, you know, I was just kind of the guy behind, behind the operation. But now I'm working at a, at, a, at a large company with, you know, on a large floor where people are seeing me every day. It, it became pretty obvious that I had, a, had an issue. Um, so I think I clung to that delusion that, you know, if I just cleaned it up a little bit, you know, I, I could rebound and I could put it all back together. So I, I, lived, I lived that for the first year or so. 
I think addiction kind of lies to us a lot too and we're in denial like yeah. I can fix this it's not that bad and we what addiction lies to us and tells us at any moment we could just recover just not today though we'll do that tomorrow <laughs> and we put it yeah. off and put it off and it just you know progressively gets worse and worse so I definitely lived like that too I I had racked up debt and I told myself I'm gonna get this better it's totally yeah. fine I got this that's a lie. It takes time to rebuild your life. So eventually you found yourself in rehab. Yeah, I think, you know, and, and having, you know, we'll, we'll recap what this looked like pretty quick. We'll flash forward without the all, all the small stories. We could make videos on videos for that. Um, you know, as, as I lost that company and then lost another job, subsequently I started to lose everything else around me. You know, I, I had lost that marriage and everything was falling apart. My family at this point in time was very, very aware of what was going on. And I ended up checking into rehab December of 2012, about a week before Christmas. And all I had at that point in time was three bags of clothes and a dollar in my wallet. And that dollar wasn't my dollar. I had somebody, my grandmother, I think, had given me that dollar because it was bad luck to give somebody a new wallet without any money in it. So, she was so cute. That, that's what I had. So that, that is what I had been reduced to. And you would have thought at that moment that that would have been my sign. That would have been my moment. But it wasn't. Um, so to everyone else, it looked like the moment. <laughs> it looked like it could have been the moment. <laughs> yeah, no. yeah. So you know, and I, I had picked up some charges. You know, throughout the, uh, throughout my my trip down to the bottom. You know, I had picked up some arrests. You know, some 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 things I was doing on the side. A couple possession charges. You know, a forgery and some things like that. We can make a whole video on, on you know, that 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 time that, that time well, span. Well, I do just want to say what the forgery was, and then we can continue. Go ahead. The forgery was he was filling fake prescriptions. He had a very smart friend that was doing fake yeah, prescriptions I mean, for Roxy's. Yeah, legit fake. You know, they had they had the hologram papers, and because I wasn't really a pill addict, and I at this point in time I was still able to present and dress myself up well enough that I could come in and fill these prescriptions. You know, with a little bit of I'd pick finesse. my places, a little bit of finesse, a little bit of charm. And I'd get out of there, you know. You know, I, I looked like a guy on Sunday coming out of church, and that's kind of what I dressed. I timed my, you know, I timed things like that. Or a cop. I, or a cop. I was smart enough, so I was doing that, and eventually got caught. So, um, so that was definitely a bad thing. That that is where you know the first of the charges started to pick up, and I accumulated some more as I went along. So it it, it became a, a legal problem for me as well. You know, at this point in my time, my my drug addiction and my lifestyle was starting to, you know, starting to get me into some trouble with the law for sure. Okay, so you got kicked out of rehab. Yep. For failing a drug test. Correct. Right? Yep. And then well, I didn't get kicked out of rehab. I finished and completed, and oh. it was you know that was a, a you know a VA sponsored uh, treatment facility. They had a halfway house there. I finished the program. I, I, I started living at you know a different floor of the halfway house. I was paying rent. I had a job you know at, at the VA hospital that they allow you know people that are in treatment or in, in you know mental health programs there and and and, and treatment. To start working, it was a very humbling experience for me. I was making eight dollars an hour, picking up cigarette buds, raking leaves. Um, I had a lot of disdain for that. I felt like I was better than that. At you the weren't. time, I didn't recognize that I was my surroundings. That I was there because I, I got there on my own, on my own free will. I was there because I put myself there. And if I was better than that, I was going to have to prove it. And I couldn't just, I couldn't just know it and believe it and think it. Um, so. I did that for a little bit and then I, I relapsed. Yeah, so I started going back and using drugs and, um, you know, had another couple passes at it, you know. Um, had a few failed attempts, you know. I think I, 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 I gained and lost some, some money along the way and um, where are we gonna go from here? I want you to talk about your aha moment. Okay. About right. what made you get sober and then right. we'll close. And I, I do want you to come back and share more stories because I love your story. Okay. Um, yeah, the, miss a lot of details here. I think we covered some of them in that live, but we probably don't want to do that here. Um, yeah. You know, and, and you know, the, the kind of the thing I want to revert to here and, and make sure I include in part of my story was the impact that my grandmother had on me and uh, and what that did to help change and uh, you know shape the life that I have now. Um, when when I kind of checked into treatment, you know, before I did that, she was the house, the place that I went to because at this point in time, nobody else would take me in and. Uh, Subsequently, as, as I relapsed several times, finished treatment, came in and out, she was a steady state that never gave, you know, she never gave up on me. She was my rock. She always took me back. She always allowed me to have a place to come to and um, try to get it together. Even if it was a few failed attempts, she never gave up for sure. And, um, you know, I'm forever grateful for that. And that's a debt I owe. And that's why I make sure every day I try to remind myself that, you know, I, because of this second chance I was given, 
I, I have to make sure that I don't waste it. And um, so my aha moment was, you know, somewhere in the, in the midst of all these relapses and, and going back and forth, I had, I was staying with her and I left to do some, you know, some sort of remedial, <laughs> you know, I, something I was just going to go do real quick. And um, I think, you know, three days later I called and asked if I could come back, you know, and I've done I, that too. <laughs> I'm gonna run right down the street and get a cheeseburger and a gallon of milk. I'll be right back. And Two then, years later. Yeah, th three, three or four days later, you know, I was in a position where I had to call and say, you know, can I come back home? And, and she kind of told me, yes, but I think you probably need to go back to treatment. And you know, I agreed. Um, I was, I was feeling pretty defeated when I had to make that phone call. You know, I, I said it's a whole story of what happened. But anyway. Um, I ended up coming back and getting a ride to drop me back off because at this point in a matter of a few days I had I ended up with no money no phone um, no car and in three days I was on a pretty good tear I think that uh, it's gonna be a good video that, that's a good video um, I think I, I think the initial story was I left to return a vacuum cleaner and I came back with no phone no money and no car three or four days later and um, she was gone with my family um, to church or whatever I think it may be I got dropped off and I remember walking in the front door to her house and standing in our living room and just being so grateful that I had a place to come back to. You know, I knew that I was going to have a place to sleep. The fridge had food in it and that was my moment. That, you know, June, June 26, 2013, the light bulb went on for me and, um, you know, for whatever it was, that was my, that was my time. That was my moment. And I remember looking around and thinking that and I just felt so defeated and embarrassed um, and ashamed of my behavior, um, what I had become, you know, the kind of life I had had and what I had destroyed. You know, I, I did all this in the same area that I grew up in, so my family, I'm sure I embarrassed them, you know, the, to the point that they would never own up to or admit to now, but I just was completely defeated by that and could not believe the, the person I had become. And I was 100% done with that. I was done. I was completely unwilling to continue on with this lifestyle, and um, I've been clean ever since. So, and yeah. you met me six months later. Yeah, six months later, um, I had, you know, whatever, whatever may have happened. I think my grandma came home. Um, I obviously spent a few days in and out of a in and out of a coma, sleeping it off. Um, you know, you know, for whatever it was, I don't know if I ever told her, you know, you know what was going on in my life or kind of what happened. I ended up not going back to treatment. I ended up, you know, not checking back into a halfway house. I stayed there. She allowed me to get myself together. I cleaned up, you know, I had some, some pending court dates coming up. She allowed me to get my act together. And at this point in time, I didn't even know if I was still going to prison or not. You know, that's a whole nother video of what happened to me after the fact. But, you know, she, she gave me that, that opportunity and that second chance at life. And I, I am, uh, I'm grateful for that for sure. So that's that's it. That's kind of where I got to. We could make a whole other video of what happened after so that. So he was in drug court. Yeah. We will do that yeah. video. Um, I'm so grateful to Nan too because if it wasn't for her, I wouldn't have you. Yeah. And that's I mean, something that her and I talked about privately a bunch when yeah. you were at work. <laughs> Thank you so much for filming this twice. You're amazing. I love you. But I just can't end it without saying that addiction doesn't care. Reese and I have very different paths in our addiction. We also had very different paths to sobriety. Addiction doesn't care that you're the most popular guy in school, that you come from a great family. It doesn't really care how sometimes the more successful you are in your own personal life, it makes it makes the fall much harder. I think I I fell so hard and fast I bounced a couple skips and then picked up a shovel on that last one and kept digging. So um yeah, it, it really there are a lot of different paths to the bottom. Sometimes people never find their way up or never realize they're there. And yeah. so that's really unfortunate. But there's also, you know, light at the end of the tunnel. There's a lot of different paths to sobriety and a successful clean life too. So there are also so many resources. So if yeah. you are struggling in addiction or you know someone struggling with addiction, do your research. There are tons of programs, tons of rehabs that allow you to go in the indigent. So definitely check into those and, and just look, look to see what your city has to offer. So I love you guys. Stay safe, stay sober, and I'll see you in my next video.